Hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of Odyssey House Journals, one of the most watched and listened to podcasts dealing with uh, addiction and recovery. I'm Randall Carlisle. Our guest is Laurel Ingham. We will introduce her in a second. And my co-host is Rachel Santizo. Welcome. Thank you. You're looking beautiful today. Thank you. But if people are listening right now, they wouldn't know, would they? No, they would not. No, they wouldn't. So if you're listening and you want to see how Rachel (laughs) looks, you have to go to YouTube and Google, or you just Google Odyssey House Journals, and and it'll give you a YouTube link. So that's our, we we got some analytics. Guess what? I'm I'm hiding my (laughs) notes here so you don't know. I can help you cheat because I think I know. Okay, Uh, thank you. Okay, good. our, 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 Our biggest, most... Uh, watched and listened to cities are this this week Cincinnati. Yeah, you're close. It, it's south of, of it's Columbus. Columbus is our second most watched. We 1,300 people oh. in Columbus, and we had 2,000 in Salt Lake. So Salt Lake was number one uh, last week. So. Good, Salt Lake is number they one. They beat this Columbus, time. Ohio. Yay. Now, <laughs> yes. if only the Utes could have beaten Ohio State in the Rose Bowl, it would have been. It would, it would have been that's that's would, painful, Randall. Uh, Come on, that seems too uncalled soon. for. <laughs> too soon. Our, too our soon. guest <laughs> is Laurel Ingham. She mm. is the development director at uh, Four Street Clinic, mm. and I know for a fact that Laurel has at least one addiction. And oh that gosh, is, what is it? Coffee, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? Uh huh. Do you know the other one? Uh, desserts. Lipstick. Lipstick. That's why you have it here. Yeah. Lipstick in a podcast. <laughs> Again, you have to watch it if you want to know. True. I, I hear you talking about coffee all the time. So I am, I am a coffee snob, I guess. What was my other addiction? You said you know two. What was the other one? The oh, I know what it was. She cares about unsheltered people. <laughs> mm. That is true. And, and is that an addiction or just like a heart? Well, you spend you spend a good portion of your time dealing with that. I spend the majority of my days. And you're a, mm-hmm. you're a, she's the development director, and, and I'm sure you could make more money uh, working for something other than a nonprofit. Uh, and. So you, so you must have a dedication. That's why I call it an addiction. You, you, I'm sure you've had offers to go a lot of other places. Uh, tell us just w- what Four Street Clinic does. For those, for those who are unaware, Four Street Clinic is in downtown Salt Lake, right around the, what used to be the epicenter of where most of our unsheltered people uh, hung out or, or did whatever. Right, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Pi- near Pioneer Park. So, yeah, so we're just Fourth Street Clinic, a, a myriad of services. Right. So, Fourth Street Clinic is a federally qualified health center. So, like very high level. We're one of thousands across the nation, and we are designated as a homeless site. So that means that we have to serve at least 75% of our patients have to be homeless. Um, and we really sit in a sweet spot of about 90 to 94 year over year of our about 5,000 patients year over year, 90% are, are homeless. So we see patients um, on the medical health side, dental health, behavioral health. We have an on-site pharmacy. Um, we have the downtown location, and now we have the spokes that are going out to the different resource centers um, on our mobile, which she's really fancy. And then we also have our street medicine. Our uh, medical outreach street team are called Most, and they really go down, you know, North Temple here in Salt Lake or out in the Jordan River um, and really to those encampments. So we really do a very comprehensive health care um, and provide all those services to over 5,000 people and about 25,000 visits. Wow. Do you have any idea how many homeless, I, 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 everybody tries to get this number, any idea how many uh, unsheltered uh, people we have, homeless people? You know, I've heard statistics along the Wasatch Front at about ten to 12,000, um, but it's also at any one given time, right? So somebody might be homeless in January, but not homeless in March. So when do we count them? So... They do a point in time count, but it really looks at those folks that are just, just in January that day. Or that those day days. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's the coldest, you know, it's really cold. So they're hoping that people are also inside. So, what would it, 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 this is a strange question, but if Four Street Clinic did not exist, what would happen to all these people who have all these medical and, and mental issues? 
Well, I mean, the community health center is really strong. I mean, across the nation that are that are federally qualified health centers. So people could access care there. But because we slide our fees down to zero, so we do on a one to four dollars, depending on your level. Um, so people could seek services, but then there's probably going to be a lot of unpaid medical claims, um, which happens a lot of times in the emergency rooms, right? So somebody shows up in the emergency right. room, they're uninsured, you know, they, they do treat, but then they're not going to get payment for that. So, I mean, the cost to the taxpayer is just going to go up, really, um, in a way that, you know, when you pay for your health insurance, they're going to cover that in there somehow, or taxes or someplace it's going to come out. So anybody can anybody can come into Fourth Street, mm-hmm. uh, regardless mm-hmm. of their situation in life. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And 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 the the thing that because both Rachel and I have been through Fourth Street a million times, not mm-hmm. for services but to work with Laurel. Uh, and we're not talking about we're not talking about some schlock little place that has. <laughs> has some greasy doctor sitting in the background no. saying, how can I help you, son? Uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's a sophisticated, it's a sophisticated nice place. clinic. Yeah, it's a very beautiful clinic. Um, it is, you know, I mean, really state-of-the-art, and we really do everything, right? So, and very professional, treat people as they come in with respect. Um, I think a lot of times folks that are homeless just haven't been seen either. So when you finally sit down mm-hmm. and just talk to somebody as a real person, you know, that's huge on your mental health side. So our staff is incredibly compassionate. We have an incredible array of services that we provide um, and want to treat the whole person. So I actually was a patient at Fourth Street. I forgot about that. Yeah. yeah. For those of you who don't know, Rachel mm-hmm. is in long-term recovery, just mm-hmm. celebrated 10 years. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. I'm going to be celebrating 10 in July. I know. So we're... I'm excited. We're, we're both close. <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, and and for a while, and if for those of you who aren't aware of Salt Lake, when I mentioned where the Fourth Street Clinic is and where mm-hmm. it was near where all the homeless people hung out back then, you were one of the people hanging out. I was. We used to call it the block. And so I actually, yeah. yeah you're like yeah. Rachel from the block. It was Rachel from <laughs> the Rachel block. Rachel from the, oh, yeah. I know her. Yeah. 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 She's it, the one who sleeps under a car. Yeah, <laughs> it is absolutely true. And so actually, um, I can speak on behalf as a patient because that's how I got connected with 4th Street. And I'm still connected with 4th Street because of how they operate. So... Um, I'm still good friends with my nurse there. <laughs> really? Yeah, absolutely. And so, do you remember the, why you went in? Um, so I went in because I went through the VOA, and so medical care is the thing that we um, we deny and that we fear the most. At least I did because I was an IV user, and so um, I needed to get my mental health medications, and I also need to get checked for. Um, I need to get all my medical needs checked, and I was really scared. And so I did not want to go to the doctor, but we always send you to Fourth Street Clinic. And so when I went there, I was able to get all my needs met, and I was very scared. Um, And I didn't want to face those fears, but going to Fourth Street Clinic, they made me feel safe and secure. And so I never stopped going to Fourth Street Clinic. They were my primary care for a long time. And then once I went through Odyssey House and treatment, I continued on. They have a committee, a consumer advisory board, and I served on the board for five years, and I stayed um, connected with Fourth Street Clinic, and I'm still connected with them today, because they just it's this long-term effect that they have. And I remember back then it was the medical care, and the the thing that was best is that you could go in for your medical care and your mental health care, and then you could go get your medications as well. You didn't have to worry about the fees, and everything was on site, and you could get everything there. And then also at that time, they started looking at dental care. We didn't have dental care before. And it was, I don't know, maybe eight Eight years years ago that we opened the dental clinic. Yeah, Yeah, eight years. And people don't realize how much the dental care is needed in our community, especially when you're trying to change your life around and the stigma is attached and all these things. And Laurel's been a great support as I've received my dental care as well that I've still been fighting through. And she's been... Um, that emotional support for me still as I'm working through 10 years later in my recovery. So just this ongoing love and support emotionally as well. And I, and I don't think people realize the mm-hmm. mentality, uh, you understand because you were there, mm-hmm. of, of somebody out on the streets who needs, who needs 
medical or, or, or emotional care, mm -hmm. uh, and you're, you're scared to go in, and you don't trust a soul. No. So, it's, it's, so you guys, when, you know, when you first walk in, it's important how you treat them. I mean, mm -hmm. you, must, you, you must talk to your intake people saying, this is how we're going to do it. Right, right, for sure. And it's changed through COVID how we do intake. But, um, you know, that's your, first, that's your first spot, right? And we want to have a place that's welcoming and kind and compassionate and provide that care. It's non-judgmental. Non-judgmental. Yeah. I mean, you walk through the door and however you are, you know, you get what you get. Um, we've also had patients that have had, you know, extreme behavioral issues in the clinic. And Absolutely. we can do a 30-day cessation. But then after that, we're going to welcome them back, right? So, you know, it, it happens. And we're going to be like, cool, you're back. Let's yeah. treat you. And, and people must walk in high. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and, and and there's no judgment there saying, oh, you're you're high on heroin or meth or something. No, and I think it's just then it's that balance of are you going to understand your medical treatment or not? Like where yeah. are you in that in that high? Um, if somebody's too high, you know, we've had people in the waiting room that are you know just going to sleep that off for a minute. But we want to make sure that they're understanding their medical care. That's kind of that fine balance. Mm -hmm. and, and do you do you make any? Do you take the harm reduction approach, or do you say you need treatment? You need to go into some place like Odyssey or something like that. What do you do? You like, know, it, it's it's individualized for each person, right? Some people are going to be like, "Yes, I want to get into Odyssey House or go someplace else," and some people are like, "You know, we partner with the Utah Harm Reduction Coalition, yeah. so we do the um, needle exchange on our site um, every. I think it's now." They were there yesterday, so Wednesdays. Uh, so people can come and get the clean needles. Um, we'll provide bleach kits. We'll provide all of that. Um, and until people are ready, I mean, we're going to have to treat people where they're at, right? People come mm -hmm. in, you got to treat them where they're at. If somebody had said to you, today's your day, you're going to go to rehab, you'd be like, <laughs> no, today's not it, right? <laughs> right like, exactly. that's not going to happen. So really, like, where do we go? Where do we, you know, those baby steps into that, for sure. And some people are ready. What is this candlelight vigil that you do every year? I was going to bring why? that up. It's one yeah. of the most emotional things I have ever been to. Can you describe that? Because you, know, you and I have where, been it's there. It's where we met. Yeah, it's, it's, actually, oh. it's actually where I didn't like you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, she was, is this podcast she, taking yeah, a turn? I know. Well, <laughs> well, we talk about it all the time because I remember telling you, I was like, why is Randall the one reading Why do you have some tea? <laughs> and TV I made my amends man. to him. We talk about this all the yeah. time. That's how, yeah. Oh, uh, I Okay, now I remember because I was like, oh, he's in <laughs> yeah, it, was, it was actually Laurel, the one that I was like, wait, why is I Randall? Yeah. I saved your bacon. So the candlelight vigil is really put on by all of the homeless services um, in Salt Lake City. And we got, Forestry Clinic just happens to be the kind of gathering spot of names. So we gather all the names of all the people that have passed away that have been homeless, formerly homeless, um, and we do a candlelight vigil. For some people, this is going to be their only remembrance so that they've died on the street. They may have died in a facility. They may have died in housing, um, but didn't have a way to honor them. So year after year, it is all the agencies getting together and putting a candlelight vigil together. It's typically in, since I've been around, and as many years as I can remember, it's been at Pioneer Park, because Pioneer Park has always been mm -hmm. in Salt Lake City, that like homeless park, if you will. I think they're definitely trying to change their reputation. Um, it's not that homelessy anymore, but, and so we just honor people. So we have, typically the governor or lieutenant governor will come and mm -hmm. speak. Um, we'll have members of our consumer advisory board from Forest Street Clinic read the names of the people that have passed away. Um, and all the different agencies just kind of funnel those names to us. And it's pretty emotional when you read off names. Like, I'm trying to think, is, has it been around 100 people? It's been as high as like 120. Um, I think 2020 was a little bit lower just because I think we COVID kind of like caught everybody off guard. Like, how do we do this? Um, so yeah, it's been as high as like 120, I believe. And so everybody is holding candles. Uh, it's generally cold because it's in it's December. Uh, yeah. and, and then people get up and, and read a list of names. Mm -hmm. And some are, I remember covering it as a news story. Uh, some are very young and some are very old. Yeah. We've had, yeah, so looking at the statistics, I think one year we had um, a child as young as like two, and then we've had people as old as 80. And typically people that are homeless... That's not that old. <laughs> oh, no, I'm not saying that. <laughs> um, as, and typically, you know, people that have been homeless or have had, you know, those traumas in their lives really die 20 to 30 years sooner. So having a homeless individual that 
made it to 80, if you will, is uh, unusual. So, are there, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but are there numbers on that that, that uh, that's because an awful lot of the time uh, homeless people are not getting the medical care that that other people mm-hmm. would be who have insurance mm-hmm. and are working at a normal job. Is there any number that, like how many years? On average, your life is reduced because you're living on the streets? 25. 25. Mm-hmm. That's from the National Homeless Council. That's like a typical year over year. They It's 25 years. So somebody who the average age span is somewhere in the 70s. Mm-hmm. So uh, the average age span would be in the 50s? Yeah. So when we look year over year at the statistics, I guess this is the way to look at it, is if you look at the number of people that died and we, that we have their ages on the statistics, it's about 50, 51. I think it's creeping up there. It might be like 51.4 years. Wow. Um, so it's, people are young. People are young. And I think, you know, you look at um, people that have been active drug users and for their life, and you look at them at 70, and you're like, oh, wow. You you know, or somebody yeah. will see somebody that's 50, you're like, I think they look like they're like 80. <laughs> it's a hard right. life. It's a right. hard life. Um, and it ages you quickly. So... It's it's I it's very rough. How do you explain this phenomenon of people who choose? Because we have three uh, very nice homeless resource centers, mm-hmm. uh, how, and 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 still we have a large population that chooses to live on the street. How do you explain that? You know, I the the only way I can explain it is it's an individual choice, right? Not everybody is the same. Um, and I had the opportunity to talk to a woman this week, actually, at our Women's Health Day, and her preference is to be on the street mm-hmm. um, or camping. Why? Um, you know, I think the atmosphere sometimes, um, she was like, you know, the women are really mean, and you know, just kind of like those generalizations mm-hmm. from her standpoint, I'm not saying those are true. Um, p- things get yeah. stolen, um, you know, and it's a lot of people, I mean, if you want to be in dorms with 300 people, um, I think it's hard. And I think until you really go in and see, you know, I mean, it's dormitory style. You're literally sure. bunked yeah. up. Um, so I just think some people are like, I just can't do, I just can't do that many people and don't want to do it. And then if they're not drug users, they're like, I don't want to be in that, you know, mm-hmm. there's a lot of drug abuse. Um, so it's just, I think it's literally just individuals. So that's the question is that some individuals, it is their way of life and that's the way they choose to live and they want to live. So how, how do we combat this homeless issue when there's also a way of life and people want to live that way? I don't know. I don't know. If she had the answer, she'd be. I know. Because it it seems that people say to, um, for homelessness, it's just buy a home, like put them in housing, right? And some right. people don't want to be in housing. Or for me personally, when I did receive housing, I remember at six years sober is when I got my first kitchen and my kids got their first room, and I freaked out. I didn't know what to get at this store. I didn't know. I didn't even think I was good enough. Like that was one of my biggest anxiety attacks that I that I had the recovery. It's like this ongoing support that you need when mm-hmm. you overcome things. Mm-hmm. So how do you combat this? I don't know. And then you have folks that, you know, are struggling with severe and persistent mental illness that are not right. organized enough to live sure. inside. Right. Right. So it's you're you're just not able to for whatever reason. So you kind of have to baby step it into there. And yeah. Some people just, you know, they're like I just liked the freedom of being of camping. Yeah. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Let's talk about Laurel for a minute. Oh, gosh, this is the part that I was so nervous about. I don't know what you want to know. You know about my coffee and my lipstick. Do you want to know about my bad eyes? Should I hold your hand here? Yeah, baby. Let's have a seance. Okay, okay, here we go. Here we go. Why do you do what you do? (laughs) Yes. I I do what I do. You know, that's such a good question. Um, I am honored to do what I do. I feel like, I feel like Forestry Clinic is that, crown jewel of a nonprofit, right? Like, you know what you're doing every day. You know who you're, you know, that you're making a difference every day. Um, And as hard as the days can be, you know, you see that you're making a difference. And maybe it's like the tiniest little thing, or, and I always go with like the one starfish at a time story, right? Um, So it it brings me joy, right? 
they've put up with me for eight years at Fourth Street Clinic. That's kind of a miracle. <laughs> um, I have a lot of autonomy. I and and telling the story of folks that really have some some serious need to the funders in the community and and that resonates um i think everybody wants to do good in the world and some people that's writing a check like this is what i can do and it's like that's a huge gift sure. right um so no i'm i really i've been in the nonprofit world for a lot of years um i've done lots of different things i worked at the symphony i did utah's for choice i did Planned parenthood i did um mm. the university of utah i did valley mental health um all of them are great organizations um but this is just really like it's a special place to be and i know i hate the word special because i think it's so icky utah <laughs> but um <laughs> But I mean, I, don't, I can't come up with a better word, right? Yeah. It's, I don't know. It is special. I don't. I may be sappy. Yeah. Like I'm not as sappy, but sometimes you it does make me sore. cry. Yeah. 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 I yeah. mean, but like, how many places do you get to work and you then get to be friends with Rachel Santiso? Well, I Odyssey House, Fourth Street Clinic. <laughs> I, you know. So two places. Yeah. Well, that's okay. That's it. That's true. <laughs> Where else? Yeah, well. Good point. I know it's, and, 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 you know, like, and, and your point, I think, is great because it, it, it applies at Odyssey House as, as well as other yeah. treatment centers. Mm -hmm. Is that, you know, if you take numbers and you say, well, how many people, you, you know, were successful in in this aspect or that aspect, and and it's the it's the one person each time you see success that yeah. makes a difference, right? Yeah, and if it's. A, it can be a giant success, right? And it can just be the small success, right? Yeah. Just, you know, I mean, for us, I think we look at, you know, sometimes like if somebody just at Forest kind of gets their A1C down by two points, like yeah. that's a win. That's right. a total win, right? Um, is everybody going to be like a Rachel Santizo and get clean and stay sober and be in recovery and go get her, you know, degree and be your lifelong friend? Probably not. But... One success at a time. And, and I've interviewed, and Rachel brought up the, your dental clinic, and, and I, I worked on a, a film that mm -hmm. uh, had to do with what kind of difference that makes uh, for people uh, on the streets. Yeah. And, and I've interviewed so many of your clients that, that are just, they're, they're tickled pink that they, that they got a tooth pulled that, that ended the infection in their mouth. I mean, a little thing like that. And it's just like, God, I love Four Street Clinic. You yeah. Know? I talked to one guy after we pulled like 13 teeth one day, right. and he was just like, his whole mouth was just like a bloody mess, but he was smiling and so happy. And I was like, he's like, I'm out of pain. But then you think about teeth, and, yeah. you know, when people have lost teeth, you really feel like they don't have anything to say, and they end up talking like this the whole mm -hmm. time. and. There's that shame in that. Um, yeah. And then, and people lose their teeth for a number of reasons. I talked to, you know, women that they've been punched out. That's a huge stigma, right? They sure. don't want that to be seen. So our dental clinic has been highly successful. You, We're happy oh, yeah. to do it. You have a big waiting list, I suppose, to get in, right? We do have a big waiting list. I mean, you have to be seen on our medical side to then go into the dental side, but we've got a great new dentist. She's awesome. She's a total rock star. We love Beck. Have you met Beck yet? I have. You have to come meet her. She's a rock star. I will. Um, and then we have volunteers from the different schools, so Roseman Dental, and she's had some different um, rotations coming through, so we, we try to get people through. We don't want people to wait, like, six months. We want to get them on as soon as we can. Being development director means uh, <laughs> it means a raising lie. money, money for, raising for the clinic, and you're you're one of the most successful mm -hmm. uh, that I've seen. Uh, uh, describe some of your, especially the big one at the end of the year. Describe, you know, didn't you raise close to a million dollars? Randall, I raised over a million dollars. Uh, oh, sorry, oh. excuse me. <laughs> so my goal Dang. this last year was a million dollars, and I kept saying to everybody, if I don't raise a million dollars. I'm going to lay down on the floor and cry. And they were like, it's going to be okay. I mean, even like partway through, my boss was like, no, if you don't raise it, I'm not going to be mad. I'm like, I am going to be in therapy. So um, so we raised 1.15. Wow. So there you go. Um, so that's a great fundraiser. It's Give One, Raise Two. It's the first 10 days in wow. December. We get a bunch of sponsors to come in and match dollar for dollar um, and then put that out there. So it's, it is a wild month of 
fundraising. And then we also have a sustaining circle program. So people are giving, you know, their, you know, 10 to $200 a month. And that is huge to know those dollars are coming in right. every month. So that sustainer circles has been a really wonderful thing. Um, we're going to go back this year to our in-person toast to good health. Who knew? Ooh, I know yes. at Caputo's. So June 9th, I think, is what the day is. And then we're also going back to an in-person food truck face-off. Yes. Those are fun. Oh, those I are fun, love right? It. So yeah. we're working on those. Um, you know, but we do a lot of grant writing. We do bring a lot of major donors through. We're right in that process right now of like not going back to our breakfast model just because we don't have room at the clinic and the space, but bringing people back through to kind of show them where we are. Um, COVID has been really hard, like physically on the clinic. So we've got the tents in the parking lot and then we had the earthquake that happened. We still have a little earthquake <laughs> damage in the pharmacy that, the you know, we need to fix the wall. So we got, we need to do a little like refresh and, you know, make us prettier again, but we'll get there. The future of fourth street. We only have a couple of minutes left. What do you, do you see, uh, do, you, do you see staying at, for, for, again, for those who don't know, it's, it's right catty corner from pioneer park, which used to be the big homeless hangout. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and you own the land. We own the land. And the building. And the building. Uh, so are you going to, are you going to move? Are you going to expand? What are you going to So we just completed a strategic planning process that's looking at the next 10 years and really looking at um, getting to be a fully staffed. So our staffing model, which would then include our facilities, because right now we don't have, we have like two open desks where people can sit. Um, looking at an integrated nice. care model, looking at how that what that looks like in our community, and really all that based on market data. Um, so if I had a crystal ball right now, I would look at it and say, this is what we're going to do. But I think right now we are, we'll start doing a site survey, looking at a study of our facility, um, and then looking at the right staffing. So there's a part of me that this is what I keep saying, like, it's really exciting, but it also scares the hell out of me because there's like a lot of growth to happen. <laughs> a um, lot of money to be a raised. A lot of money to be raised. And then I think, well, let's just close, let's like wave a magic wand and blink and have it be like 2028. We have yeah. a new building and facilities and the right. staffing, but um, that doesn't happen. 10 stories high. 10 stories high and, and it's done. And we, we, may, we answered all the questions. So right now, I mean, to answer your question, honestly, like, everything is on the table there's not any one like we're going to tear this down we're going to build here we're going to move everything is on the table for fourth street clinic as we put those plans out there and for, talk about them for those that can um physically come to the clinic let's talk about the mobile clinic real quick like mm -hmm. where does the mobile clinic go so the mobile clinic goes to very fixed sites so we have our community partners so it will go to the different resource centers the three resource centers it'll go to the like voa detox a voa youth so very fixed sites mm -hmm. um because we want to you pull that thing up and it takes a minute to settle and, and make it happen whereas the street team is in that little swap van so they can just kind of like go yeah. wherever yeah. so um you never know where they're going to be they'll kind of go to the different encampments but the, the mobile itself is appointments and at spe spe specific sites okay. we'll close with a revelation a very personal revelation that Laurel, up to this date, was a virgin. A oh, podcast, podcast virgin. Podcast virgin. Yeah. I was like, yeah, this is my first. <laughs> Who knew? Well, did it hurt? Was it okay? <laughs> it was slightly painful. We? It was a little, I mean, it's a little nerve-wracking when you're like, what's the topic? And they're like, well, you know, you and forestry calling. I'm like, oh, I don't. I don't feel like it's, I mean, is it interesting? Like, are people going to listen and go, wow, why was she there? Well, they either do or they don't. They're going to, Columbus, know. Ohio is like, delete or turn it off. <laughs> no way. Sorry, no Columbus, no Ohio. Way. I'm sure Columbus must have a clinic like yours. Yeah, they all, all states would have a federally qualified health center. And whether or not it's designated for homeless is unknown. Um, but there's also design, different, different designations. There's rural and Indian health and different things. Right. I don't I think those are all rural. I don't, is it Indian health or anyway? I don't know. You did a great job. I'm sorry, you you're not a virgin anymore. But, I know, you know, right? Oh goodness! No, don't he's not. Don't tell my mom. <laughs> he's definitely <laughs> not. I'm sorry. Not <laughs> you did a great job. Thank you for thank being here. Thank you. Did and yeah. you deserve to be heard. So thank you for yeah. being here. Ah. Yeah. I love you and I appreciate you. You're still on this journey with me, and you do a lot of good work. So thank wow. you for yes, being you here. Do. Well, sharing your story is huge. Thank you. I think that's, it's very brave. Thank you. You're brave. 
Well, I have my coffee, my lipstick, and my glasses, so I have like. I my think crutches. we need to get lipstick. We should put what lipstick right here. What a love fest we close with. Thanks, guys. Thank, Thank you. you for Thank watching you. another edition of Odyssey House Journals.